Good afternoon to all. I'm Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association. Um, at the outset, let me welcome all of you for this webinar, webinar on rehabilitation approach to 3D deformity of the spine, managing adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, organized by the expert committee in medical rehabilitation of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. The expert committee in medical rehabilitation has been organizing uh, academic activities, webinars throughout this year. It's a fairly young committee, but then uh, were able to, I mean, the committee uh, so far was able to arrange so many activities and contribute vastly for development of the field of the rehabilitation. I'm glad to see that we now are moving towards more and more complex issues. Uh, the scoliosis is it's not an uncommon problem of adolescence, and it is very much, I mean, it's concerning and it's a worrying thing for adolescents. So it would be important for all doctors, physiotherapists, and all the healthcare professionals who are with interest in rehabilitation to be familiar with the rehabilitation of school uses of adolescents. I'm glad that Dr. Naomi Sinaratna, MBBS MD, acting consultant in rehabilitation medicine, rheumatology and rehabilitation at, at rheumatology and rehabilitation hospital Ragana, accepted our invitation and agreed to make this presentation on this important topic. Uh, so let me uh, invite Dr. Uh, Naomi Senaratna to make a presentation on managing adolescent idiopathic uh, scoliosis and rehabilitation approach to 3D deformity of the spine. Naomi, over to you. Good afternoon to you all. I'm Dr. Naomi Senaratna from Rheumatology and Rehabilitation Hospital, Ragama. Today, my talk is about rehabilitation approach to a 3D deformity of the spine. So I'll be discussing on conservative management of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Why I put the word uh, 3D deformity? Because from now onwards, you have to look this common deformity as a three-dimensional abnormality, though you have seen it before as a two-dimensional deformity. That will allow you to have a more comprehensive analysis and understanding about scoliosis and its management. Scoliosis usually be defined as a lateral curvature of the spine, but it is a complex deformity which involves all three planes, coronal, sagittal, horizontal. To get the overall picture of scoliosis and to plan your treatments, basic understanding of abnormal structural changes in all these three planes is utmost important. So in here, as you can see, you get lateral curvature in the coronal plane. And there can be increased or decreased curvatures of sagittal planes. What are those curves? Thoracic and lumbar curves in your sagittal plane. For instance, patient with the scoliosis can have increased uh, thoracic kyphosis. You call it thoracic hyperkyphosis and sometimes you may get reduced lumbar lordosis. So that will actually um, imply that the, the, the sagittal plane is not in a proper position, it's imbalanced. However, there are additional rotatory changes. They are in horizontal plane. Vertical rotation leads to the prominence, what you call hump formation. So identification and analysis of abnormalities in all these three planes are helpful to get the big picture of scoliosis. It is a complex deformity. Why did I want to highlight the sagittal plane issues here? When some animals became bipedal animals during evolution, they developed the vertical uh, structural adaptations in the spine to maintain their uh, stable posture during standing on two legs. However, as you can see here, humans are unique because they can hold their spine straight on the pelvis compared to other bipedal animals. They have anteriorly flexed spine. 
So this adaptation is basically due to sagittal curves, specifically lumbar lordosis and pelvic lordosis. This has allowed the humans to have straight standing on two legs. So this created unique biomechanical forces at the spine, which crucial in the development of scoliosis and its complications. So um, the researchers actually analyzed this theory and uh, the evidences uh, depending on the experimental studies and they have uh, suggested that the uh, development of scoliosis is unique to the uh, human spine compared to the other bipedal animals. This is basically because of this, uh, the, the nature of the biomechanical forces. Uh, when it comes to etiologies of the scoliosis, there are a number of neurological, genetic and skeletal pathologies which can give rise to formation of secondary scoliosis. The causes can be congenital, congenital scoliosis, occipital cervical anomalies, paralytic causes like cerebral palsy, polio, and connective tissue disorders, which are a bit common, Marfan syndrome, Erlodandlos, and neurofibromatosis. Skeletal dysplasia, storage disorders, mucopolic saccharidosis, and some of the genetic causes like Prodeveli, trisomy 18-21, and uh, neurogenetic syndromes, uh, chocolate meritude. This is Frederick's ataxia, spinal muscular atrophy, and some thoracic surgeries, it's iatrogenic, laminectomy, and thoracotomies. At last, but not the least, idiopathic entity. Even though I have listed it as a last entity here, it is the most common type of uh, scoliosis. According to the age of onset of idiopathic scoliosis, there is a classification based on age. If the onset is between first two years, it is infantile. Between three to nine years, juvenile idiopathic scoliosis. Adolescent, which is common, 10 to 17 years, and adult, more than 18 years. From all of these categories, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is common. So, from here, I'm going to focus my presentation to adolescent idiopathic scoliosis or AIS, which is the most common type of scoliosis in the clinical setup. It is prevalent between 2 to 3 percent of adolescent and uh, more females are affected with this condition, 90 percent in females compared to boys. But there's no single causative factor for the development of idiopathic scoliosis has been identified. So it is thus termed multifactorial. The causes can be genetic, neuronal, biomechanical and hormonal, even the melatonin, leptins and some of the genetic, uh, the, uh, some of the genes, uh, multiple genes have been identified as a, a causative factors in the pathogenesis. As I mentioned, there are many factors uh, in the development of the uh, AIS and actually these factors accelerate the asymmetrical growth of the epiphyseal plates of the spine. You can appreciate in this slide. So uh, therefore AIS appears at peripubertal stage where you get the maximum growth rates. So, this asymmetrical growth of vertebral bodies leads to progressive wedging of the vertebral bodies, which follows asymmetrical pressures on the growing spine. These forces are mainly posterior shear forces and they actually lead to vertebral rotation. Ultimately, this forms a vicious cycle where you get anterior side of the spine lengthier than the posterior side. So these abnormal forces allow spine to develop different types of abnormalities in all three planes. Rotation, twisting, bending and so on. So on the coronal plane you get a lateral curvature. Concurrently, this accompanied by the imbalance of sagittal forces and uh, de to develop the sagittal imbalance, thoracic kyphosis, hyperkyphosis, lumbar lordosis, reduction and so on. And in addition to that, the rib abnormalities due to the vertebral rotation. So ultimate external appearance of the trunk asymmetry is the underlying structural pathophysiology of this uh, condition. 
So you may wonder what claims deformity comes first in the development of scoliosis. So some believe it's lateral curvature, but depending on the studies and uh, the, the, the identification of the, the biomechanical forces in the human uh, spine, uh, many have suggested and believe that it's the rotation, vertebral rotation initiates the sequelae of events. So my next part of the presentation will focus on evaluation where it can be divided into two types, clinical and radiological. So clinical evaluation should be done by history and examination. In the history, in the current symptoms analysis, it's important about deformity, who detected, when it's noticed first, then about family members with the condition. Um, this is important for the diagnosis as well as to determine the outcomes for the treatment. Any clinical features, such as the secondary Next, whether the patient attended menarche and pubertal growth spurt, past history of neurological disorders, spinal trauma, peripheral surgery, and some of the important information you can collect through your history. Examination forms the fundamental objective analysis of the trunk deformity. Proper examination at your eye level with good exposure is important to detect the asymmetry of the trunk and further analysis. So, Adams test. Adams forward bending test is the screening test. All, uh, you, all of you may know it. it uh, so, uh, here you will look for the hump formation when the patient is uh, bending forward with straight knees. Functional element of the scoliosis due to leg length discrepancy can be eliminated by asking the patient to sit on a chair and do the test. So uh, in functional scoliosis, this hump will be disappeared when the patient performing the Adam test in sitting position. So when the Adam test is positive, then you have to uh, check the, uh, the hump uh, uh, to uh, get the trunk rotation. It is called uh, angle of trunk rotation, ATR. So at the level of the maximal hump, uh, we can get the ATR by placing a scoliometer. As you can appreciate in the picture, place the scoliometer at um, the scoliometer zero point along the spinal process and get the reading in degrees. Here it is about 12 degrees. ATR can be used as a simple and quick screening test for scoliosis. So it is recommended that uh, if a patient uh, have a scoliose, uh, scoliometer reading of more than 5 to 7 degrees, you have to evaluate it by doing proper x-rays. It is really important to assess the external asymmetry of the trunk objectively. It is for the detection of severity of the trunk abnormality and uh, you can follow up and monitor the trunk aesthetics to assess the response for your treatment. There are different tools to assess trunk aesthetics. One such validated tool is the TRACE, Trunk Aesthetic Clinical Evaluation. You have four subscales in it, asymmetry at shoulders, uh, score from 0 to 3, scapulae 0 to 2, waist. 0 to 4, hemithorax 0 to 2. But ultimately, you have to add 1 uh, for the total value. Uh, that's how they have validated it, uh, their research papers, and uh, get the total value out of 12. Here is the example of uh, grading uh, the asymmetry at shoulders. So you will have a three scores. One is a mild uh, abnormality, two moderate, three is a significant asymmetry at shoulders. Then at scapular level, you have uh, two scores. You, here you actually assessing the flatness of the scapular blade. Um, then you uh, grade if it is a mild degree uh, flattening as a one and as uh, in this uh, picture below, it is very flattened on the left side, so it's T, uh, 2. Waist, you have 4 scores. If it is a mild asymmetry, it is 1. Bit moderate asymmetry, 2. And 3 and 4 have a significant asymmetry on one side. And how do you differentiate 4 from 3 is uh, in 4 uh, score, 
um, the one side of the trunk waist will be very straight. So it is very easy to uh, define uh, the four score with the significant asymmetry on the other side. Hemithorax, you will have two scores, mild prominence and lateral deviation is one. Significant lateral deviation with a very prominent uh, hump, it's two. So here I will give you some time to see and score trunk aesthetics according to tracing this picture. So here you may give one for shoulder, isn't it? It's a mild asymmetry. And what about the scapula? Flattening of the scapula on the left side, it's only mild amount. So it is again one. And what about waist? Yeah, one side completely straight, and uh, the other side there's a wrinkle formation and significant deviation. It's four. Hemithorax. Yeah, it's about one. So, the total uh, trace score in this uh, picture is 7 plus 1, 8. On the other hand, objective assessment of the sagittal profile can be done in many ways. One such instrument is inclement. You have to place the inclement at three levels at uh, C7, T1, Thoracos, thoracic junction and uh, at the maximum slope at lower thoracic level and lastly on the sacral slope at S2 level. You have to get the each uh, angles at each three levels. And then how do you uh, check the thoracic kyphosis and lumbar lordosis? You have to just add the angles at thoracic and thoracolumbar levels this gives us to uh, the angle of thoracic kyphosis and similarly summation of angles at thoracus uh, lumbar and uh, sacral level S2 gives rise to lumbar lordosis angle. Another important measurement is the plumb line where you place a plumb line along the thoracic convexity at T6 level uh, along the midline and measure the distances at different levels C7, T12, L3, S1. So there are normal values for these uh, plumb line measurements. Uh, at C7, the normal range is 35 to 40 millimeters. And T12, it's up to 12 millimeters. And uh, L3, it's 45 to 55. S1 0 to 20. So, and depending on the, the changes of the normal values, you can assess the sagittal imbalance. So, for example, let's say if you have plumb line measurement at C7 is exceeding 40 millimeters, which means there is a forward flexion of the spine in that patient. So, there may be increased thoracic hyperkyphosis. So, if the um, L3 uh, distance may be uh, say less than that below 45 millimeters then you the patient might have reduced lumbar lordosis so how that's how you detect clinically the sagittal imbalance with your plumb line measurements next you have to check the stiffness of the spine this is important to detect the correctability of the deformity by treatment. So you have to ask patient to bend left and lateral. This uh, lateral bending, uh, if this uh, allow changes to the severity of the spine, that means the flexibility of the deformity. Actually, that means that the patient's spine is not very stiff. The deformity is very not 
not very stiff. So it indicates the good outcomes for the breast treatment. Neurological examination guides us uh, to exclude secondary causes which might need further evaluation like MRI. If there are red flag signs like hypertonia, increased reflexes, upgoing plantas, then you have to evaluate by doing MRI of the spine to identify the secondary causes. The other aspect of evaluation is radiological. The X-ray of full spine is the gold standard investigation to diagnose scoliosis. You have to order this in a correct manner. Order it as a full spine X-ray with bilateral femoral heads, AP lateral. The recommendation is to take X-ray if 80 are more than 5 degrees during your scoliometer measurements. So if the value is less than 5 degrees, the X-rays are not indicated. What is the diagnostic threshold for the scoliosis? It's the cobb angle more than 10 degrees. We can get several informations by analyzing the x-rays and uh, uh, to get the radiological measurements. They are curved magnitudes, degree of rotation, morphology of the vertebrae and ribs, location of the curve and risk of progression. Curve magnitude is assessed by cobb angle. So what is this Cobb angle? This is the angle made by most inclined to vertebrae. You have to draw lines from upper end plate of the uppermost inclined vertebrae and lower uh, end plate of the lowermost vertebrae. I think you can appreciate clearly in this picture. These two lines, the angles between these two lines give the Cobb angle. But however, sometimes measuring uh, and drawing this x-ray, uh, this uh, cob angle on x-ray film is not sometimes very feasible because sometimes you can't cross those lines on x-ray and you can't clearly see it. Then you have to apply your simple geometry to the uh, evaluation. So then you have to draw perpendicular lines from the previous two lines and then crosses those perpendicular lines. The angle uh, created by this uh, uh, crossing of the uh, perpendicular lines forms the angle which is really compatible with the real cop angle. But uh, however, there are some other ways of measuring this cop angle. They are sometimes easier but uh, probably having some uh, errors in it. Uh, this is just a summation of uh, inclination of the uppermost and lowermost vertebrae. So you, have, you can actually measure the inclination by using goniometers, scoliometer, and there are some smartphone apps with scoliometer measurements. And then you can just sum those two inclination together to get the cup angle. Apex vertebra. What is this apex vertebra? Apex vertebra is the most rotated vertebra in a particular curve which is situated between most inclined two vertebrae but it has no inclination but maximal rotation. Depending on the location of the uh, apex vertebra there is a classification to the uh, scoliosis curves. So if the apex vertebra is situated between um, C1 to C6, you call it cervical curve. Then how about at cervical thoracic junction at C71, then it's a cervical thoracic curve. So to say it is a thoracic curve, then the apex, uh, apex vertebra should be situated between T2 to T12, thoracolumbar T12, L1, lumbar L2 to L5. However, the most common types of curves are the thoracic, thoracolumbar and lumbar curves. The next important classification is the severity of the curves. This is basically depending on the degree of curve angle. So if it is an angle between 10 to 24, it is a mild 
degree of curve. If it is 25 to 45, it is moderate. And if it is more than 45 but below 60, it's severe. If it is 60 and above, it is very severe. So very severe means uh, increased risk of progression and poor response to the treatment sometimes. Vertebral rotation. So this is another important measurement and uh, clue about the risk of progression during your radiological assessment. So how do you detect cob rotation? So you have to first draw uh, a line along the midline and then divide the half of the uh, vertebra into three sections. Then if the spinous process of the particular vertebra at the midline, it is not having, uh, it is not rotated. So if it, if the spinous process in the first section, it has one plus cob rotation. If it is in the second section, it's two plus rotation. If it is in the third section, it's three plus. So what about completely out of the vertebral body. If the spinous process uh, in the x-ray of the particular vertebra is completely out of the vertebra, you call, is you call it is having maximum rotation with a 4 degree cob rotation. There may be different abnormal morphologies you look for x-ray spine. They sometimes give clues about diagnosis as well as prognosis of the condition. So vertebral fusion, rib fusion, partial segmentation, those are different types of morphological abnormalities that you may encounter in x-rays. These are the things that you have to look into. Most importantly, potential risk of progression can be assessed by x-rays. It is called a score. This is the fundamental analysis of risk of progression. So it is a scoring system depending on the ossification of the iliac epiphysis. So as you can appreciate here, if no ossification at all, it is risk zero. If you see some ossification above iliac bone, then you have to divide the iliac epiphysial plate into four parts. So if the ossification covers about 25% of the plate or the First part, the result score is 1. Up to second part, or the 50%, it's 2. If it is 75% coverage, it's 3. If it is totally covered but not fused to the iliac spine, you may see the uh, radial lucent area between the uh, epiphysis and the, the iliac bone, then it is 4. Then if it is fused, it is reason 5. So there can be some different, different uh, issues. There can be some uh, uh, differentiation issues uh, when uh, reason uh, 0 and 5. So how do you differentiate it? Because both of them are similar by just looking at the epiphysial plate and the real bone. Then you have to look for uh, the other places like epiphysis at the femoral triradiate cartilage. So if the triradiate cartilage is also not fused, it is open, then most probably it is risk zero. So if those uh, epiphysial plates also ossified, then it should be risk five. Radiologically, you have to assess the angles of thoracic and lumbar sagittal curves. These angles are very important in determination of the risk of progression and design of braces. So thoracic kyphosis is measured by angle between upper end plate of the T1 and lower end plate of the T12. You can clearly identify it in this x-ray. Right? Then the um, lumbar low doses is measured by angle between upper end plate of the T12 and lower end plate of the L5.
and there are some other spina pelvic parameters which are very very important to decide the balance of the sagittal profile because if there is a sagittal uh, imbalance then uh, the corrective forces during brace treatment and uh, the, the compensatory mechanism of the um, spine all sorts of things uh, come into play and then you have to uh, decide the disabilities and pain and uh, uh, the uh, the sagittal balance also implies the risk of progression so then you have to look into that but i'm not going into detail because of the time constraints that that is why i have said you have to get the full spine x-ray with the bilateral femoral heads so uh, but keep in mind that the radiological measurements like sacral slope i have uh, illustrated here in the first picture left most and pelvic tilt, pelvic incident and sagittal alignment and sagittal vertical axis all those are different radiological measurement that you have to measure and because of this sagittal imbalance there can be different compensatory mechanism for the sagittal balance disorders they are the reduction of thoracic kyphosis uh, I have listed in the right side of the picture, uh, the, the right side of the uh, slide, retroly the spaces of the vertebral bodies, hyperextension, pelvic back tilt, knee flexion, and ankle extension. All sorts of things are there to compensate the sagittal imbalance. Then this can give rise to uh, pain and a lot of disabilities to patients. So as a rehab expert, you have to analyze those things properly. Uh, in x-rays and in patients to uh, get the overall uh, holistic care in terms of rehabilitation of the scoliosis. So here uh, I'll give you some time to recall what I said up to now in the evaluation part because it's sometimes a lot of information in the evaluation so just recall it. So I'll talk about the history and what are the information you have to get there. Then about the objective trunk assessment with trunk uh, aesthetic clinical evaluation, trace. Then uh, you are checking uh, the um, hump and uh, the angle of trunk rotation. Then you have to check the um, uh, inclement and plumb line measurements to get the sagittal imbalance. And then you have to exclude possible secondary and red flag signs. Um, then uh, you have to combine this uh, clinical evaluation with the radiological uh, measurements uh, with x-ray full spine with uh, bilateral femoral heads ap lateral you first you have to get the cob anchor with most inclined two vertebrae then where is the uh, curve located whether it's a thoracic or lumbar curve those are really important uh, so during the management uh, uh, protocols i'll discuss about the, the importance of those things and the uh, risk score to get the, uh, the risk of progression then uh, the what is the sagittal profile thoracic kyphosis number low doses and the other spinal pelvic measurements so next we'll move on to the management protocols of ais uh, Primary outcomes of conservative management. What are the primary outcomes of uh, rehabilitation of AIs? They are the morphological or functional outcomes. So morphological are the external appearance, appearance and the reduction of trunk asymmetry. So what the patient most concerned about. It can be assessed subjectively and objectively. So there are different tools to assess that because this is very important uh, to um, quantified this is very important in the follow-up so uh, the subjective aesthetic assessment you are asking um, from the patient that whether the patient uh, what is the perception about uh, his or her trunk asymmetry what are the pains uh, disabilities um, and uh, what is the quality of life and all so uh, they they actually uh, uh, validated different different questionnaires and tools to assess these morphological and functional outcomes. In terms of subjective aesthetic assessment, uh, Walter Reed visual assessment scale, spinal appearance questionnaire, trunk appearance perception, uh, you can use. Objective assessment, uh, as I said, trace and positive index. Um, functional 
outcomes, the disability and the quality of life. Those are the functional impairments. Uh, basically, the, the what is the improvement of disabilities due to pain, posture inflection, and cardiac and breathing problems. What is the, uh, the the pattern of sleep, any sleep deprivation, and so on. So this can be assessed by SRS 22 questionnaire. Is it called uh, quality of life profile for spinal deformities? Brace questionnaire, uh, like tools. So please concentrate on this slide. This is a really, really a important slide, even though it is very simple. Uh, here what I summarized, the risk of possible health and disability issues in adulthood depending on the cop bank. If you not really uh, uh, plan your management to overcome the problem of uh, the risk of progression in some of the uh, patients with uh, uh, severe curves. So you can see the risk is shooting up from 30 degrees to 50 degrees. The risk of health problem and the disability issues is very, very um, uh, high whether between the cop degrees of 30 to 50 degrees. So be, beware when a teenager come to you with the scoliosis of cop anger somewhere around this level. So you must be cautious and sensitive to plan your treatment and proper follow-up to prevent future problems of pain, health issues like cardiac and breathing problems and other disability issues due to the postural imbalances. There are different management options according to the presentation of each case. There can be observation, and uh, exercises, they are actually physiotherapeutic scoliosis exercises and braces, plus or minus exercises and surgery. The first three options encompasses the rehabilitation approach of a uh, scoliosis, scoliotic. Uh, as most of the other rehabilitation approaches, this is also a multidisciplinary approach. The team of management is the rehab specialist and uh, PNOs, the orthodists are the one who design and fit braces. Physiotherapist, uh, basically concerned about the postural adaptations and uh, the postural corrections and train the, the uh, uh, exercises to correct the trunk by uh, physiotherapeutic exercises and this is really a um, emotionally and psychologically cumbersome issue because it's actually the uh, the disease which uh, have great impact on adolescents who actually have um, a great concern about their external appearance during their teenage and at the puberty so they sometimes very emotionally upset and uh, sometimes the the treatment as well the brace treatments are really cumbersome you have to wear the plastic and rigid braces throughout the time all the day during even the sleep so it's really uh, important to have a proper compliance uh, from the patient so the psychologist and the counselors have a great role uh, in the rehabilitation of uh, scoliosis. As the braces are the main options for conservative management in AIS, I just want to present some information on that. So there are different types of braces, soft, rigid and very rigid. This is actually depending on the material and how the, the, the brace applied forces on the trunk. Right? So braces are different in the material as I said and the designs basically which will guide the principles of correction so depending on the biomechanical corrective forces they apply on the spine they will stabilize the spine or reduce curve and both so milwaukee boston shenu and leon braces are the rigid braces you can appreciate well in this picture and they have strong corrective forces Spine core is a soft elastic brace which allows mobility of the trunk than rigid one. Rigid one actually prevents the trunk mobility. However, recent advances in the bioengineering technology has allowed more advanced computer-based designs. 
even though they are very expensive. So in our country, we made custom-made rigid braces and leather-based uh, soft braces. Right? Duration of the brace treatment. So duration of the in brace time depends on our goal and the severity of the problem. So it can be partial time or full time. That is the two base, uh, uh, basic categories. So 18 hours, 20 to 21, 23 to 24, those are the, the common uh, duration in brace times. Uh, so 18 hours usually you prescribe for the soft braces like spinal cord braces and sometimes during brace weaning uh, in rigid braces or sometimes if you want to uh, allow some time uh, to have a mobility of the spine. Uh, so it allows stabilization of the curve magnitude. So 20 to 21 hours, uh, uh, again a little bit partial time. So it's a stabilization and reduction of the curve. So with the increment of the embrace time, you can have a bit reduction of the curve. And the full time, 23 to 24 hours, it's basically a net correction of the curve. So, um, the rigid braces are usually applied in full time manner. You have to prevent uh, the further progression as well as the uh, reduction of the curve, not allowing any uh, passive movements or the active movements uh, in the trunk. So, there is a set of uh, criteria to choose the best option of treatment to a particular patient. You have to think about curve magnitude. Uh, if it is a very severe curve, uh, you have to be cautious. And what is the risk of progression? Aesthetic appearance and the trunk asymmetry. Uh, is the spine is rigid or flexible? What is the sagittal profile? It is imbalanced or severely deteriorated. What is the family history? So are there any family members who had uh, bad outcomes for the bracing treatments and the other options and uh, lastly the availability of a multidisciplinary team because a rehabilitation of a adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is, is not a uh, single man role it should be a uh, proper uh, uh, team based management you can't just refer the patient to a rehab physician or the physiotherapist uh, to manage uh, the patient because it should be like a holistic uh, evaluation and analysis and uh, the discussion of the treatment. So this is again an important slide. How do you assess whether the curve progress or not? That depends on main three factors, gender, future growth potentials. It can be assessed by physical growth and skeletal maturity. Curve magnitude at the time of diagnosis. What is the curve angle? Um, what about the vertebral rotation and sagittal profile? So generally, males have a, a, a more risk of progression compared to girls premenarchal age because the patient is at peripubertal growth threat, uh, risk sign zero, double curve more than single curve, thoracic curves more than lumbar curves have high risk of progression. And more severe curves, usually the curve degree more than 30, as I said before, and sagittal imbalance. Those are the, uh, the indicators of uh, high risk of progression. This is again an important slide. Um, you can appreciate in this picture that there is a peak growth rate around puberty with high risk of progression. When it is around 0 to 1, the growth rate is maximum and they need to gradually decline with time. That is why we have to be vigilant when an adolescent presents around his or her puberty. Treatment protocols for AIS depend on many criteria as I mentioned in the previous slide. To understand it better, I present it in this way. Um, suppose you get mild degree of curve with curve 15 degrees. So you have to check the criteria. Uh, and assess whether the criteria are favorable or not. So suppose that the patient is having is a 3 or more and phrase 1 to 3 and sagittal balance is completely normal. You don't have any abnormality in the spinal pelvic parameters. So in that case you can actually uh, 
observe for a while usually about six months because there is also three you know so it means that the growth maximum growth rate is uh, probably uh, over then what about uh, risa one or two that means the patient has uh, maximal growth rates at the time of the diagnosis and then trace about four to six that means the the big significant asymmetry of the trunk and trunk uh, rotation is five to ten millimeters then you have to offer physiotherapeutic scoliosis exercises and um, probably follow up after six months or if the risk of progression is very high then you can actually revive the patient after three months then suppose the patient has a risa zero with the maximal growth rates and trace seven or more that means asymmetry is significant very marked and flat back positive family history and stiff spine all are unfavorable factors then you have to offer brace soft braces because of the curve is not very uh, severe it is a mild degree you can actually offer soft braces spinal cord braces for that patient uh, uh, on uh, half a uh, partial time uh, uh, basis and as if the patient after six months then what about a scoliosis of 25 degree curve again you have to go, uh, go through uh, criteria if they are favorable like it is a three or more phrase one to four normal sagittal balance with atr two to six millimeters then you can offer physiotherapeutic uh, scoliosis specific exercises and then uh, relief after probably three months and then what about reason one to two trace five to six and atr seven to nine millimeters then you have to offer soft braces to prevent further progression because this is just before 30 degrees which is the crucial value then what about this zero trace nine or more atr nine or more and flat back with other uh, unfavorable uh, uh, characteristics like stiff spine positive family history then you have to offer hard braces you can offer rigid braces partial or full time depending on the the, the particular patient's uh, clinical and radiological assessment then 35 degrees so i actually put that previous uh, graft uh, in this slide to remind you that uh, the degrees in the the uh, crucial period just above the 30 and uh, the risk of health and future disability issues are more with this curve so you have to immediately uh, intervene to correct the curve and further progression uh, so Suppose that the criteria are a bit favorable, reason one or more, trace one to seven with the normal sagittal balance, then you can offer rigid braces full time and uh, you can actually frequently review in here, probably about after one month uh, or uh, depending on the, the other factors, uh, three months. And then uh, uh, with uh, very unfavorable factors with a very very high risk of progression like reason zero trace age or more flat back positive family history and stiff spine you had to offer very rigid braces on full time brace this is really really cumbersome so you had to offer uh, and you had to educate counsel the patient to get the maximum uh, compliance because um, all your treatment plans will be depend on the patient's compliance and uh, counsel the patient about the, the, the importance of uh, wearing the brace properly. 50 degree curve. It's a severe curve. They can have many health issues and disabilities in the future. So ideally surgery is indicated. So very rigid braces can be offered to delay the surgery, specifically if the, the, the uh, a uh, long waiting time or if the patient does not uh, uh, like to go for a surgery um, or whether if the patient wants to have some time to think then you have to offer very rigid braces and delay the further progression 
follow up of uh, ais patient is usually every 6 months so if there is a high risk of progression you have to plan 3 months review and uh, the risk of uh, progression is really low then you can extend it up to 12 months generally imaging should be arranged annually unless it is really indicated more frequently like in cases like high with high risk of progression worsening criteria for treatment and poor response for the treatment so um uh, this is how you plan your x-rays so just after bracing you have to get a in brace x-ray to assess the fitting and then after about 1 month to assess the response with the in brace x-ray then after about 6 months with in brace and out of brace x-rays this is uh, to um uh, assess the in brace correction and uh, the the correction of the uh, spine uh, after uh, about 2 to 4 um, hours of out of brace uh, time so my uh, keep in mind that you have to um, prescribe out of brace x ray after at least about 2 to 4 hours of out brace time so then thereafter you can actually um, prescribe annual x rays to assess the um, uh, response for your brace time poor response or progression of the curve should aim at uh, stepping up of the treatment ladder if you have uh, offered a soft braces for a particular patient and see poor response with a curve progression beyond 5 to 7 degrees then you have to offer a rigid braces to prevent further progression and if it is a partial time brace in brace time then you have to offer full time brace likewise and always check the compliance because without checking the compliance just adjusting the brace is um, not good for the uh, uh, proper outcomes and brace weaning always should be gradual if you see a, a marked correction like uh, curves uh, uh, which has come down from 50 degrees to 25 degrees you are not just uh, 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 wean the brace by like more than 5 6 hours per 2 uh, weeks so that will again uh, deteriorate the uh, the abnormality so always brace weaning should be gradual it is recommended that you have to wean by like 2 hours or probably 1 hours per 3 months so uh, that is the end of my presentation on uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis um, so i would like to thank many people here um, uh, dr dumindu munida is a consultant in rheumatology and rehabilitation uh, hospital at rrh who is um, uh, my mentor and uh, who actually uh, taught me a bc of re- rehab medicine and offered me the opportunity to get the advanced training of re- uh, scoliosis rehabilitation and similarly dr dumind abasing who taught me a bc of scoliosis rehabilitation uh and uh, to uh, sri lanka medical association for giving me the opportunity to share my experiences and uh, thank you my patients who taught me a lot during my whole career yes thanks again thank you very much thank you very much naomi could you hear me Yes, madam. I think uh, you can also hear me properly. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, now maybe we can hear you well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that excellent presentation, Naomi. Uh, I think. Uh, it was a very complex subject but you made it very simplified so um, i think a lot of us learned quite a lot of things um, and uh, some of the questions that were answered asked in the chat i saw that you have answered them as well so i, I don't know if there are any more questions i think we'll give some time mm-hmm. for the others to ask questions uh, if there are any queries that uh, you need to ask now we Hello I'm uh, Arya 
May I ask my question now? Yes, yeah, yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, madam. Um, may I uh, have some uh, comments on the use of high heels among females and the impact of such uh, wear uh, with regards to scoliosis? Yeah, thank you for the question. That is actually an interesting question. Um, the thing is, uh, as I discussed in the pathogenesis of uh, AIS, they haven't commented about one uh, such um, like a um, cosmetic causes. Actually, no one single causative factors has been identified as uh, patho uh, at the onset of the uh, pathogenesis of all. Genesis of AIS, but um, some say that uh, that uh, excessive, um, yeah, uh, uh, like engagement of some sports and uh, the postural um, imbalances, uh, the bad postures. But however, uh, in the, in the research papers and the experiments, uh, uh, it is not actually uh, correlated with uh, the pathogenesis of AIS. It's basically. Um, multifactorial you can't actually blame to any one single causative factor so you don't have to tell any teenagers or the young adults to uh, don't wear heels of course you may have some kind of a mecha mechanical uh, uh, the issues like a long-term usage of high heels can cause back pain and all but it's not uh, like really uh, correlated with the development of AIS but if you have a, a patient with AIS with a severe curve and uh, back pain and other disabilities of course you have to um, ask them to uh, like uh, remove those things because sometimes they might have uh, leg length discrepancies on there and uh, the pelvic oblique and the uh, the abnormal sagittal balance. So then that can actually worsen the condition. So did I ask you a question? Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you very much. And thank you for the excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, yes, are there any more questions? I, uh, uh, there's one more question, Naomi, uh, in the chat box. Could you please explain on managing examination data of scoliosis in pediatric patients? Yeah, probably uh, Ravindra is asking about the examination and the radiological evaluation. So, um, of course, infantile scoliosis and the juvenile uh, scoliosis, you have to complete the, 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 I mean the, the comprehensive analysis by doing clinical examination because there can be a lot of underlying neurological and the genetic causes. So, uh, so you have to complete the evaluation in your history and the examination. And apart from that, the radiological examination, like uh, to identify the morphological changes, rib abnormalities and the rotations, and uh, to assess the, the cop degree and the, the severity of the curves are same. It's similar to uh, overall patients. Only the problem is sometimes you can't make the patient stand and properly uh, position on your examination uh, tables or the, uh, the places uh, where you might have some errors of uh, assessing those things. So then you have to uh, actually your analysis should be and the assessment should be very comprehensive and holistic. You can refer to physiotherapists as well as the prosthetist and orthotist because they have their, uh, their specific gadgets to um, uh, properly uh, take the measurements, uh, uh, pelvic and the sagittal balance as well. I have one question, Naomi, with regard to pediatrics. Uh, yeah. Is there any age limit now since the pediatrics is a growing age? So whether there is an age limit that you have to wait for or uh, oh. you can start even at the beginning? Is there anything like that because of the ossification and, you know, uh, of the spine mm -hmm. and everything? So there is some kind of a gap between the pediatrics because they are still growing compared so to... You mean you mean for the bracing and the, the, the yeah, intensive yeah, treatment yeah, exactly. like yes, so yes. it's all depend on the 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 i mean the like a risk of progression and the the, the sequel, eh? so they said like for infantile people you can observe for 3 months if the curve degree is very low 
and uh, so you can actually offer uh, physiotherapy uh, scoliosis exercises for uh, another three months if the curve magnitude is similar or probably not uh, like improved more than five degrees in the next review and if it is very severe actually there are uh, rigid braces you can offer rigid braces because you have to prevent uh, the, uh, the, uh, the marker deformity at the scoliosis because it will allow twisting of the thoracic organ that can give rise to a lot of cardiac and uh, respiratory problems. And by the time you uh, like diagnose in the scoliosis, you have to exclude possible underlying neurological condition because otherwise your, res uh, your tr uh, and the expected response for the treatment will be not good if there is underlying uh, like aggressive condition. So that is their recommendation. Okay, thank you. I think there was one more question. Uh, we can allow one more question there. Uh, in the chat box, uh, someone has asked about uh, having extra lumbar vertebral six with it because may cause uh, scoliosis. Whether that would cause scoliosis. Yeah, additional additional vertebrae, number of vertebrae is not involved in the, uh, the, the onset of the uh, scoliosis. Uh, so if uh, it is morphologically abnormal or it can, if it is like a, creating a, a abnormality for the posterior shear forces and the axial forces, so that biomechanical abnormalities and the forces can give rise to that kind of a thing, but it is like lower most uh, kind of a, um, uh, vertebra. So the possibility of uh, only just an, uh, with the additional uh, vertebrae is not uh, correlated with the onset, really. Okay, right. Uh, so in the absence uh, of any further questions and the time uh, issue, so I'd like to conclude this session. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Naomi Senaratna, for that excellent presentation. And uh, on behalf of the SLMA, uh, SLMA uh, Expert Subcommittee in Medical Rehabilitation, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Sri Lanka Medical Association. Rajesh, shall we advertise mention of about the conference? Hello. Yes, madam. Shall we, uh, shall we share? I, uh, I do not know because we can share. Uh, Shall we ask Vihanga, madam, because I do, I'm on the floor. You don't have it, no? Sure, right, if I, it's all right. So we are just, just let us announce uh, that the uh, expert committee on um, medical rehabilitation will be conducting a conference on medical rehabilitation on 29th and 30th. Uh, again, would be uh, uh, Zoom-based uh, from 12 to 4. Uh, it would be, uh, we recommend that to medical officers, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, nurses, there would be an speech therapists and all, all in rehabilitation team, there would be something or the other to all involved. So just keep the day and the time free and to uh, join for both days, uh, uh, that would be important. So uh, we would be uh, uh, circulating the flyer, just go through the flyer, share with others, and uh, just make it a point to see that you joined the conference. Thank you. Over to you, Raj, Saraji. Okay, madam, I think. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hello, Vikanga, you can close this session. Yeah, thank you very much for joining. Uh, thank you for this excellent presentation on uh, uh, rehabilitation uh, of, for the uh, scoliosis in adolescents. Um, Thank you very much, Paul.